Thank you, Antonia. <clears throat> and good evening, everybody. You're allowed to respond. Good evening, everybody. <laughs> this is a civil society forum. It doesn't need to, to emulate some of the other uh, formalities of other spaces. So please, smile, nod. Thank you. It's nice to see you. So I've been asked just to provide a little bit of, uh, of context, and, and I think it's firstly very important to say um, the role, the, the vital role that an independent and free civil society uh, plays around the world. Um, only with these diverse perspectives and experiences can effective policymaking take place, and it's often civil society, those uh, who are meant to benefit from policies uh, who are able to offer the lived experience in the hallowed halls of the, of the UN and other spaces. Uh, as such, I'm very grateful to all of you for braving the long lines and the traffic and all the other impediments uh, to coming here uh, for just being present in this space. It's, it's quite a statement, even our, our, our being here together. Um, and for those of you who are unaware of how the system works for civil society participation in the HLPF space, uh, we're organized through a system known as the major groups and other stakeholders. This structure is meant to give voice to a variety of different constituencies within civil society, broadly defined, uh, so that we're able to contribute a diversity of perspectives to the UN and its member states. Uh, there are currently 18 such constituencies, but more are likely to come in the future. Um, and these major groups and other stakeholders have come together to put on today's program uh, which we hope will give ample opportunity for our voices to be heard uh, and recommendations to be communicated across the international system. That's who we are. But I also think it's important to analyze this moment in human history. To many, it appears to have much more darkness than light. But I'm hopeful that during the next few hours, we can spend more time perceiving and understanding the magnitude of the light that we truly have around us not to ignore the numerous injustices in the world, but to consider what's needed to move forward at this moment. For example, our current narratives need to be rethought. Success, even development, is largely defined in, in terms of the accumulation of material wealth. But the science is clear regarding the harm that extreme wealth causes in the world, both to the wealthy and to society as a whole. Yet the excesses we decry in rhetoric are often praised in the media, and therefore represent the logical results of the goals and values that we are all told to embrace. If science is not enough to demonstrate uh, the limitations of the current model, we have an emerging prophetic voice coming from the youth who are leaving institutions of learning to tell us our house is literally on fire. But are they not our treasure and those for whom we are all working? This should not be their burden, though their voices are vital, just as this crisis is not their doing. Those of us in this building have a duty to not only put out the fires, but to learn how to rebuild in a way that prevents future fires. It's clear that knowledge is no longer the gap. We have the evidence, we know the reality. The gap is commitment and creativity, and most of all, in courage. The world is one. Our interconnection and our interdependence can no longer be denied. Yet the systems and structures in place are a patchwork of treaties and institutions, a far cry from the organic wholeness of humanity and the earth. It's as if we've tried to build a bus by taping together horses, bicycles, and cars. The Sustainable Development Goals, if applied at all levels of governance, would represent an important advancement in our collective thinking about the nature of progress. But writing the goals is distinct from realizing them. And though the former was difficult, it is in the latter where humanity is truly being tested. The intersecting crises we see now give us the vantage point to recognize the limits of, for example, a growth-based paradigm or the pursuit of power over others. But again, knowledge is not the limiting factor. Courage and sacrifice to counteract the inertia of our current order, especially from those who benefit most, is what limits us. We see that we can no longer afford the preservation and protection of systems that perpetuate an unsustainable status quo. We know we need policy action and individual action to reduce, for example, carbon emissions, but many lack the will to do it. We know that discrimination against any group results in harm to all, and yet we fall into patterns of power and identity which don't make room for everyone's voice. Far from a source of despair, however, humanity's growing understanding is a cause for optimism. 
We're standing at the precipice collectively, and the opportunity to, to, say, to take decisive, constructive steps is actually quite exciting. And we all are protagonists in this process. And this opens up a key role for global policy as well. It must align with the vision articulated tonight and four years ago and in the future. This is a call to move beyond the UN as merely a forum. And this can begin by recognizing the many gaps at the global level and working with organized civil society in genuine partnership to fill those gaps. And hopefully that's what will come out of this evening's gathering, opportunities to fill gaps and work in partnership and move forward collectively. Thank you.